Okay, um, I'll go ahead and get started. This is uh, using Postgres Excel. This is uh, our agency's success and failures. I'm going to give you guys a rundown on how we use, uh, have implemented Postgres. Um, implementing a new ba database like uh, Postgres Excel can be a challenge. Um, there's a lot of uh, pieces that you have to pre-configure. Once you get it all up and running, though, we found that it's actually fairly stable. And uh, yeah, you don't have to be like this guy. It's, it's a little tough at first, but it really doesn't have to hurt that much. Um, we found that using Postgres XL uh, has improved all of our, a lot of our analytics. So it, it doesn't have to. As long as you uh, follow our guides um, and our suggestions, I think you'll be okay. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna kind of give you a rundown of how we did it, and as we went along, we hit a lot of snags, a lot of bumps, and a lot of bruises. We got a lot of bruises. Um, luckily, I was all in test, and uh, of course, everything's in test. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about you know what we did. This uh, we've gone through, and uh, went, today we're running ten data nodes on in our Excel cluster. So today I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of an uh, overview as far as what Javelin is and who we are, because uh, it's a little different to have an advertising agency here uh, speaking at a Postgres um, um, conference. The reason why we adopted Postgres XL over just a standard uh, Postgres instance as well as other um, methods to shard your data, to use PL proxy, those kinds of things. Um, we're going to I'm going to give you an overview of the environment we're running. We'll talk about some tweaks that we made to turn this cool idea into a functional, more production-like environment. Um, that's going to include things like security, um, some config uh, changes that we made, as well as um, I'm going to help you or show you guys how we figure out how to make the data migration from a standalone Postgres environment over to an Excel environment a lot, a lot smoother. Um, and we also developed a little dashboard that sits on top of Excel to kind of give you an idea of what the environment looks like at any given time, as well as a database explorer. All right, who is Javelin? We um, is an advertising agency that has both creative, strong creative and analytics teams. We, um, I work primarily with the analytics uh, teams. We pull in lots of data. Uh, from our clients, and we answer the questions about how is my how are my advertising campaigns doing? Um, what you know, where are they at? Why why are customers buying? Why are they not buying? Um, so that's my plug. If you want to learn more, I can give you more uh, later. Our challenges. So we had tons of data. Lots of unstructured data, and we get feeds from everywhere. And despite our best efforts um, to give out, here's how we want our data, and it never shows up like that. We get we get uh, fixed width uh, a lot of times without format cards. We get CSVs, we get Excel spreadsheets, access databases. We get all kinds of stuff, and we had to push it all inside of one particular database format. Sometimes we actually took it as its raw form and stuck it in there. At then we give it to people and they query it and we have no idea how they're querying it. And so we needed a platform that would take advantage of, you know, pure text searching uh, without having to add indexes on everything. Um, and then not only just doing searching, but we also had to do a lot of aggregation. Um, and the aggregation on some of these larger data sets were taking too long on a single Postgres instance. And so we were trying to look at, okay, well, how can we do that? faster. Uh, and then not only how can we do that faster, but how can we load the data faster, get the aggregation, get the report out faster. Uh, what we had started out with monthly reports, our clients pushed us, well, we want weekly reports, and now they're starting to push us, well, we want daily reports, and then some are near time. All right. So our goals were spread the workload of data loading, uh, maximize the select and group by type performance, um, allowing queries to run 
faster on non-indexed columns, non-indexed tables. Um, and then we want to expand our database space and avoid thread bottlenecking. So as you guys know, or, uh, or may or may not know, Postgres is a single instance, um, meaning you know when you make one connection, that one thread that gets spawned is your only thread that gets run through the life of your query. And what we want to be able to do is figure out some way to split that out. Um, I've done a couple of attempts to split queries up on a, using a Perl, but it's, I can't give that to users for sure. They have no idea how to use that kind of stuff. Um, so our solution, we picked Postgres XL. We stuck it on these uh, Mac minis right now, and they ha each have eight cores, 16 gig of RAM, and solid state drives, we swapped out. We bought the uh, server chassis versions, so they have two solid state drives in them. Uh, they all run Linux, which is obviously record, required by Postgres. And we mirrored the terabyte drives, and they run uh, ZFS. So in ManMath, we have a 80-core Postgres environment with 160 gigs of RAM and 10 terabytes of space, usable space. All right. Does everyone know what Postgres XL is? Yeah? Yeah, there's a couple people in here that have a pretty good idea. Okay, just to give you a heads up, XL is a horizontally scalable open source database uh, SQL cluster-ish, and it has three primary components. The GTM, which kind of makes sure that everything's on a level playing field. It makes sure that when you write timestamps to a database, it writes the same timestamp across uh, your distributed tables. It makes sure that uh, all your data nodes can complete on time or complete the transaction and will roll back if necessary across all nodes. The coordinator is the is similar to a, a load balancer slash program manager. When data come, when a request comes in or a query comes in, it will parse out that query and then push that down to its data nodes. And the data, and so no data actually lives in the coordinator level. It, it, and then the, so that coordinator tends to be high CPU, high memory usage. The data node is where all the data actually sits. So you have uh, all your real data sits down at your data nodes. And it gets split out uh, based on the way your tables uh, has been defined. This is our Postgres Excel environment. Right now in production, we have one coordinator. Um, we have, uh, the GTM proxy, the GTM, and the GTM standby uh, for failover purposes for the GTM. And we have our 10 data nodes. The idea and the intent was, was good. However, we haven't quite figured out how to integrate the coordinator, or I'm sorry, the GTM proxy, and get it all run seamlessly. So I'm kind of, once we figure that one out, we'll, I'll write another paper and we can talk about it next year. Uh, hopefully it doesn't take that long. Um, everything else runs great. So right now we have one coordinator. We, in our test environment, we actually have been able to implement a second coordinator after the fact, like post installation. So you take your environment, then you add, <coughs> add and remove devices, nodes. Uh, the other one is we can add a data node and then remove it. There's some, diff not difficulties, but there's some data you have to, or things you have to understand when you do it. Like it doesn't auto rebalance your data unless you extract it and then write it back. But that's, you know, that's one of those things that you just have to plan for. All right, so deep breath and don't punch anything like the guy in the beginning. Um, get used to seeing this, failed um, to get pulled connections. This was the bane of our existence for a long time, actually, is every time we would touch one thing, we'd start the cluster up and then we'd go to query it, oh, it's running, we'd query it, and we're like, oh, failed to get pulled connections. Oh, it was awful. Um, a lot of times, though, it's because um, there's a few common scenarios that cause the fail to get pulled connections. Uh, one of them, you may have a node down, so like one out of ten, and that was that was actually what drove us to make the dashboard is because we'd have a node down, and there's ten of them, and we have to go log in one each one. Are you running? Are you running? And we finally find the one. Uh, the other one was uh, the nodes may not be properly registered, so after initial uh, deployment, you may not have run the PGXE pool uh, reload, which reinitializes the coordinator, letting you know where all the nodes are. Um, or what generally caused later in after uh, post-install 
was a PGHBA conf uh, issue. We ran into it when we were trying to lock it down and make it more production-like, because uh, out of the box, it's trust all. And so we had users, hey, I got a user and then a password, I'm sorry, a user ID, and they log in. It doesn't matter what password I give it. They would connect it, and that wasn't necessarily great. So uh, again, you may have a node down, the try reloading the PG pool, and the other one is the PG HBA comp security. And I will address a lot of those as we go through here to try and prevent the punching of anything. All right, so the configuration tweaks. So to, with most Postgres installs, the out-of-box configuration is adequate. It's not perfect, but it's adequate to run most general Postgres um, environments. However, we tweaked ours to maximize the available hardware. So like I said earlier, we had 16 gig. We wanted to make sure that Postgres was aware of all 16 gig and can use it. And these were dedicated machines, so they weren't like running some third party ETL app or anything like that. So they were just dedicated Postgres. Um, so we had to expand a lot of connection usage based on the number of nodes. We found that as you add additional nodes and they start communicating with each other, that you start running thin on connections at the data node layer. So we had to increase that to make sure that we address that. Um, we also, um, the preventing of Postgres XL environment from hanging itself on prepared transactions. We actually ran into some where these two phase uh, commits were hanging around. They would get kind of like stuck. And uh, we tried turning them off. We're like, well, they're annoying, so let's just turn them off. Yeah, that didn't work out so well. That uh, actually didn't work out at all. We ended up turning them back on and making sure that the, that the environment had enough uh, wiggle room to be able to commit and get rid of all those or deal with them. So, like I said, most out-of-the-box uh, config worked great. Uh, for the coordinator, we did make some changes. We uh, set max connections to 100, and then this, you have to play with it based on your applications, but right now, this is adequate for us. Um, the max prepared transactions that we up to 100, the max pool size we set to 100, and the rest of these is really uh, dependent on your environment, but for us with 16 gig, we set the maintenance work mem at 512, the effective cache size to 10 gig, uh, work mem uh, 50, so on and so forth. I'll go back up here, this maintenance work mem. When you're doing your initial migration, it's best to set that high, and then post-migration, go ahead and drop that back down. And that's so that you give Postgres enough uh, room within memory to, to incorporate these large data sets. Um, the data node's basically the same, except the, we lowered like the effective cache size, the maintenance work mem, um, and all those other pieces, the work mem and shared buffers, just because uh, your coordinator is going to be much more, like I said earlier, memory intensive, CPU intensive, and your data nodes, while they do a lot of work, they eventually ship all their data up to the coordinator. The coordinator puts the final touches, the cherry, and then sends it back to the, to the uh, user. So that leaves us, that, like I said, the tweaks there were pretty minimal. Um, and then we've got into security. Out of the box, Postgres XL works great, um, but it's not an environment that I would put in front of my users um, or an application, actually, uh, without tweaking security to require password authentication. Um, we also found when we tried to set that, we were like, okay, we'll, all, we'll lock down everything, and uh, we, we, we locked down everything. Nothing worked. Um, so we ended up having to tweak that a little bit to allow, when we add a second coordinator, to allow them to communicate with each other, as well as data nodes. Uh, um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we also found that when you add users using standard Postgres, uh, create user, or create role, and you give them permissions, uh, when they opened up a GUI tool like PG Admin, you couldn't see databases. And we would say, yeah, we gave you a user. You should be good to go. And they'd open up like, Where's my data? I thought you moved it over. So there's an additional grant statement that you need to run. Um, so for the coordinator PG HBA comp, we set, I use this nifty little laser. Um, we set this for localhost Postgres to trust, but that really only 
helps us enable and run scripts locally, maintenance scripts, uh, things that are uh, directly related to the Postgres environment. Everyone else that's non-Postgres, we set that to MB5 to prompt them for password. Uh, but that, this is really where it becomes important. Um, the host, this is our little subnet for our production environment. So the coordinators will trust any other nodes that are within uh, that subnet without prompting. Everyone else, or this is similar, this third line is very similar to this up here. Uh, we set that to MD5. And then this bottom one is everyone else. Uh, we prompt them for a password as well. Why are you trusting everybody in the local I'm sorry? Why are you trusting everybody in the local uh, Are you talking about this, this line right here? Yeah. Okay, it's very similar. It's actually redundant. It's the same thing as up here, more or less. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's the coordinator. Well, but it does, they communicate with each other. And in this instance, it was um, the local host, the coordinator sits on top the same node as a, as a data node. But honestly, we might be able to take it out. I don't know. We, I don't think we've tried. So but this is what we have in production. It's a good question, though. I'll probably uh, have to go test that out. I'll let you know tomorrow. Yes, it is. Okay. And the only reason we have that is the only reason we have that is is actually for the migrator piece and a couple other scripts. In a if we had a mass massive amount of users and they had access to our machine, then we would remove that. Cuz No, at the at the OS level, that's what But yeah, it, we could remove it, and it won't affect the actual Postgres Excel environment. It's just for our administrative purposes when we're running stuff and doing my data migrations and such. Yeah, we'll get to that, actually. Uh, the data node is uh, similar, uh, with the exception of uh, down here. They uh, are set to trust everyone. Uh, you can't actually. You're not really supposed to connect to the data node directly anyway. So when we turn those off, I want to say that it did not work so well. We Yes. Yes. Um, oh, that's right. So I just looked at my notes. When we added the second coordinator after the fact, after the post, um, when we set those to MD5, they no longer would work kind of brought everything else down. Why, why? I don't know. I honestly don't know yet. Uh, that's actually one of the things I hope to solve at this conference. We came with a lot of questions. OK, so getting off the HPA conf, um, adding users. So you would grant all on a database to a particular user, but then we had to run this additional grant statement, uh, PG, uh, grant select on PG sec labels to and then the user of the, uh, the role in order for when you open up uh, PG Admin or any other GUI, it would act they would actually be able to see the databases that they had access to. Prior to that, when you opened it up as a non Postgres or super user, you couldn't see any databases. So that was just a little something that we, uh, we ran into. For our automated stuff, uh, it wasn't a problem. And you can still do like on PSQL, when you run it, it, everything worked. You just couldn't see it. So it's just a little nuance. All right. So that brings us to data migration. Um, you can do simple data migration via PG dump and PG restore. And we've gone from older versions and newer versions, and they both will work. Um, and they'll import fine. Um, but what we found was uh, an issue is if you leave it up to Postgres Excel, it by default picks hash unless there's a unique constraint. And then at that point, it'll take that unique constraint and make that the distribution key. Um, and again, that works fine. Um, but if you have limited disk space and you're moving large chunks of data and you don't want to have to 
redistribute later, then uh, that's why we actually came up with this PostgreSQL data migrator. Simple migration really is quite simple. You just do the PG dump and PSQL or PG restore. Um, what we ran into, though, is when you use very, very large, when you're exporting or dumping very large databases, uh, large tables, we were running on the Excel side, uh, we were running into memory issues. Uh, we would get that error down there. So uh, invalid memory allocation request size. Um, it actually took us a while to figure out what the heck's going on. Everything's fine. We'd update, we would up, restart the, the cluster, all kinds of stuff. And uh, what we ended up doing is we never truly solved it. We just fixed it by doing it differently. We, we suggest actually doing a PG dump to a file. And then it doesn't matter where the file is, just as long as you can then do a PG restore, connect to your Excel environment, and then push it in. At that point, it doesn't have any problems. But when you pipe it, we were running into that error. OK. And as you're piping it in or you're loading in PG Restore, um, what we suggest, what I was doing, is I would watch the loads and make sure I had even writes across all my nodes. So here's a, this is a screenshot of all our nodes, 1 through 10. And the yellow, this is using Inmon. And the yellow, those are disk writes. Um, so uh, that way we could tell where the data was going, making sure we were getting a nice even distribution. And again, this is using the PG dump, PG restore. Uh, one, and what really kind of triggered the, the next, the data migrator tool was, I was watching us, we were moving a bunch of Twitter dump data, and uh, yeah. I'm, I don't think I quite know. Uh, the one from just Postgres. Okay. And you use uh, the dump taken from this one to the Excel dump? Yes. Uh, the issue has a default uh, definition of the distribution of the, of the I'm sorry? Yeah, I think, sorry, yeah, with PG dump, the Excel version, it will, the DDL, From my Postgres environment. From, no, just, just, no, from my Excel environment. Right, we were going the other way. Yeah, right. yeah. so and we haven't gone, I have, we haven't had to yet, at least not in massive amounts, PG jump from an Excel environment and then restore it back into an Excel environment. Uh, but to, uh, when you add a data node, you have to dump the data and then re-import it. To, in order to get a nice even distribution again. So at that point, it would be useful. We just haven't had to do that yet. Uh, it's a good point, though. Uh, and like I said, we were doing different versions. Um, we're, we have the luxury of having an old 8.4 version all the way up to 9.5 version in our environment. So we get to, to, we got to test all of them. Uh, well, we did our initial. We did our initial deployment of our initial build out of 10 nodes, and then we migrate a bunch of data from a standalone Postgres instance. Um, when you have a table that's already distributed across 10, 10 nodes, or whatever, however many you have in your, in your environment, uh, and you add a, an 11th node, it doesn't auto redistribute. And so you have to dump the data out and write it back. And you don't have to do a PG dump. You can just do a create table and then insert. <laughs> That it's actually a subset, but it depends on the method in which you define your distribution. It's a good question. And there's reasons to do either or. OK, because we ran into an issue where data was not being distributed properly, because by default, if PostgreSQL, when doing the import, uh, the PD restore, if it doesn't already have the distribute by column defined, it will. Uh, 
use if there is a unique column or a, some type of a table constraint. It'll use that. If it can't find that, then it uses the first eligible column. Nine times out of 10, it's the first column that's there. There's a, a number of data types that it considers valuable or viable, and most of them are. Um, ours just happened to be the table that I noticed. It was a domain name. And the data that we were restoring had like seven primary domains. And so only the first seven nodes were actually getting data, uh, which from an administrative pers uh, perspective, if you have uneven distribution, then all of a sudden you're going to have nodes that are running out of disk space faster than your other nodes. And so it, that's what makes it important is the ability to manage that data and make sure it's either replicated or distributed properly. So if you have a large environment, um, it becomes kind of a nightmare to go through every single table, analyze it manually, and figure out the distribution type that you want. So we came up with, uh, we wrote a tool called Postgres XL Migrator. That's pretty creative, huh? No. For a creative agency, that's about as creative as I get. Um, the Postgres XL Migrator will, you point it at a, a schema within your, your source environment. And you can give it a list of tables, or you can just say, hey, look at my entire schema. It'll go through each table and find out if it has constraints. It won't mess with it. If it does have, uh, if it doesn't, and it'll go through and look at the first couple of columns and let you know if these are eligible columns for distribution. Uh, the tool is actually a very simple shell script. There's uh, four files, I think, overall, with one config file. Um, and we'll walk through that config file. And not only does it tell you whether or not this is a table and here's your suggested uh, distribution, it'll actually do the PG dump and PG restore for you. So you give, it the, uh, you give it the source and the target and it'll move your data and make sure that it's properly distributed. Here's a, here's a sample. Um, I cleaned it up a little. Normally there's timestamps to show you how long it takes for each piece. But the uh, Excel migrator, this is a simple run after you've uh, updated the config script. It will clean out uh, the old, so this distributed column info is actually the temp table that it creates. Uh, there's two functions. Uh, one of them does the DDL, one of them does the, um, the uh, analysis of your tables and it saves it in there. And then, uh, then, um, it start, and then this is where it actually goes out and starts to looking at your environment. Right here, this schema, my schema does not exist. So inside your config file, we'll talk about that. If your schema in your target environment doesn't exist, it will create it. Um, and then it uh, checks the distribution, and then it starts generating the DDL. So it sounds like it's similar to the Postgres Excel um, dump. It'll create it with the uh, distribute by. Uh, clause in there if it's applicable. If it's not, like if there's a if you have a constraint on your table, it won't apply that. It'll let uh, Excel do all the, that work. This is where it uh, will create that table. So it creates the DDL and then it executes it in your target, so your Postgres Excel environment. And then down here, this is where it checks if you've already migrated that. Uh, we've when we're doing our testing, it uh, instead of going out there and having to clean up your your schema or whatever, it will actually drop the table and then recreate it and re-import your data. Uh, these are standard Postgres outputs, letting you know that we created it, blah, blah, blah. And then it grants the permissions. Uh, and then it, right down here, this is where it exports the data from your source database and it restores it to my database. And then you're done. So this is the config file. It's pretty simple, uh, straightforward. You give it your host, uh, the source database, and the uh, user, and then uh, your Excel environment, so your source and your target, and the same thing. Now, there's not password in here, and that's uh, we're using. It'll prompt you for password if you don't have your HBA account uh, set up for trust. And then this is the uh, schema. So this is the target schema. Uh, and then the, it'll be recreated or replicated from one to the other. Uh, this is the schema owner. 
Oh, yeah, and that's one that's worth noting. If the schema doesn't already pre-exist, it will create it in your Excel environment. Uh, the user does your schema owner user does have to pre-exist in your Excel environment, and that's it'll assign the permissions to uh, or the ownership to that user. And then down here, you can actually give it a uh, space delimited list of tables to migrate, or if you just use the word all, it'll migrate your entire schema over. And then this distribution type. If you set the distribution type, as long as if there are no constraints on your table, it will use that distribution um, as the distribute type. If you, in one instance is, if I have a bunch of smaller tables down here uh, and I want them actually replicated because I use them in an update, then I would set that, um, I would set this to um, replicate instead of the default, which is hash. And that becomes important later when we talk about updates and how those happen within Excel. The, uh, this is a continuation. So right here, this is the temporary table that gets created that holds all of the analysis results that then gets looped through. Uh, this dumping, oh, sorry, this dumping ground, this temp Excel migration, that's just some directory that you give it. Uh, make sure it's big enough to accommodate a whole PG dump of, of your, your uh, schema, because depending on the tables, it will write everything out to disk and then do the restore to avoid that memory issue that we ran into. Uh, this one is a clean flag. Well, yeah, that's what it's called. Um, it will actually, if you set it to no, it dumps out all the DDL. It dumps out everything to a file so that you can then go back and look at it, make changes, and execute them individually. Uh, if you, it, that includes the dumps. So it'll leave everything out there for you to look at it. If you uh, set that to yes, it'll go back and clean itself up so that you, by the time this script is done, you have your source data and you have a complete migrated uh, schema in your Excel environment with no residue. Any questions about that? Okay, so we've talked about um, security setup, what we've done to make it kind of friendly for both users and, and production-like environment. Uh, we've set up some configs um, we've gone through some config settings to make sure that the Excel environment is able to handle itself uh, without getting tripped up. Um, and we've also talked about how you move your data over. The impact of the change, um, we first did a couple smaller uh, moves. And what's funny is we get more problems. We've run into more issues with automated processes than we have with our users. Um, and, and they use it, so it's not like, oh, with we don't hear anything because they don't use it, but it, we see them using it. Um, the, uh, but we did run into a couple things. So inserts in Postgres Excel are, are slower, um, and there's a myriad of, of reasons for it. Um, but if you think about it, it being uh, fully ACID compliant and having to have all those checks and balances, when you do inserts and lots and lots of inserts, like batch inserts, they get, go through the coordinator and they get pushed down to all the other nodes who may or may not be doing stuff. And so the coordinator, before it can retar return back to the, uh, the session saying, I'm done, it has to wait for all those data nodes to finish. So there's a lot of overhead that goes in with that. Uh, and updates, table updates uh, actually turned out to be kind of tricky because you can't do updates based on a distributed table. Uh, we'll get into that as well. Our, uh, the fix for that is either use a replicated table or a, a common table expression. Yes, avoid insert statements. Insert statements are slow, especially when you're trying to insert hundreds of millions of records and you're trying to do it in a timely fashion. Uh, that just won't happen with uh, XC. So what we did is we had to move all of our ETL jobs from doing inserts uh, which are relatively fast in a standalone Postgres instance, to using copy slash bulk load. And uh, once we did that, what's really nice about the copy statement is it gets pushed through the coordinator. The coordinator understands the, the distribution type. It splits that data up, pushes it all down to the data nodes. The data nodes do their commits, and then they send back to the coordinator and say, we're done. And the user can go on and do whatever he wants, while the data nodes then go back and they update the indexes, all that stuff that might be uh, applicable. So 
uh, copy when you're doing large, large inserts uh, are the way to go. Updates, updates uh, distributed or not supported. So if you run a simple update statement based on an existing uh, distributed table, uh, which is the default uh, for when you do an insert or any type of migration from uh, standalone to Excel without defining it as, as a uh, replicated, you'll get this pretty little error. Could not plan distributed update. The most annoying thing that we ran into is it doesn't actually, the columns we're updating aren't even really the ones that are the distributed by. So in this case, the ID was the distributed ID. And I can understand if we were in there swapping around IDs, that wouldn't necessarily be good. But we were just trying to update the first and last name. Um, so we went round and round, and, and the community actually helped out. And they said, oh, yeah, if you use a common table expression, you're good to go. So you just wrap it up inside with the with clause, and uh, your update will work without problems. Uh, another solution is actually to take your temp this temp test TBL and make it a replicated table, provided it's not a huge table. It's, it's a good solution as well, uh, especially if you're going to be dropping and recreating. And it's small. So you can you know, go ahead and use that. All right. Um, this last bit is the Postgres Excel dashboard. So one of the things that we ran into with uh, Postgres Excel is there's a lot of moving parts. And as you add more, it gets more complicated. And without going into each one, each node looking at it, trying to say, OK, well, how is it going? What node is having problems? Um, how's space? Where's all my space being consumed? Um, it takes a little while for somebody to go in there, write the queries, run them, and then compile the results, and then give that off to the management, if you will. Um, so we came up with uh, a simple to, to configure and deploy. Uh, the pages are um, real-time. There's no underlying database, so you don't have to install a database because what good is a, is a dashboard that gives you, hey, my, my nodes are up if the database is down. Um, you won't even be able to pull that page up. Uh, and it does all the hard work for you. So the page actually will do uh, cross-node database sizes, so it'll tell you how big your overall database is. It, it combines all, however many nodes you define. It'll also tell you where all your space is being consumed by giving you the top 10 tables. And the most useful one for me is this active sessions component. Um, both the Postgres Excel uh, dashboard and migrator are available at, at our website, this is javelin.mg, Postgres 2015. The uh, config file, like the migrator, <coughs> is real simple. Uh, we use a multi-dimensional array. Uh, and you just define, you give it, these are, these are just friendly names. You can name it anything you want. Um, and then you basically give it your connection information over here for each node. So this is a, a connection for a coordinator and a data node. And you would just basically repeat that array for the coordinate, each coordinator and data node you might have. Uh, the same thing for GTM proxy, however, and the GTM. However, those don't have usernames um, or a database, really. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that piece of it. Just tell, tell the config script where it's at, how to connect to it, and tell what port it's listening on. All right, so this is the uh, Postgres Excel dashboard. I might be able to pull it up. This is our test environment. So this is real. It um, does self-refresh so over time. It gives us things like ping, port status, uh, the number of sessions. So right now in our test environment, there's two out of 100. Uh, it does look at deadlocks. And if any of these are deemed unhealthy, it will actually turn that whole square red or yellow, depending on what's going, what's going on. Uh, here's our test data nodes down here. Um, this, the page will self-reset. Again, there's no database here. Um, you can click on one of these, and it'll take you to the sessions. So you can actually see the sessions and the activity. If there were queries going on, it would show up over here. Uh, it does highlight it. It says, hey, this query's been running for longer than 30 seconds. You may want to take a look at it. Um, one thing that we did with Postgres Excel, when you, run the, uh, when you look at the active sessions, 
it actually only gives you access sessions for whatever database you're connected to. So we had to go through and based on the node that you pick, it, you can change your nodes here. Um, it will actually figure out what databases are on that node and then go through each one and find all the active sessions and then respond it back. And this page actually combines all of that into one nice little view that gives you a, an idea of what's going on. Uh, this little button's kind of fun. Uh, it'll actually go out there and kill that process. So you have a query that's running or it's gone astray. You gotta use it. It's, it doesn't really know how to write queries. Um, you can actually kill it. Uh, let's say it has some strange lock going on. And this will just do your standard uh, kill, um, terminate session. Um, if you go over to the environment, you choose a coordinator. And it goes out and it does all of this on the fly. So it gives you the total database sizes where everything's being held at. It goes and it tells you the health of the particular coordinator, which is the experience your users will be having, uh, the GTM status. It gets this JMini 14. Uh, it gets that from the actual settings of the coordinator. So if it goes through and finds out who, what GTM I'm looking at, uh, this is the reason that's important is it actually, you can configure it to point to multiple um, proxies that then point to one coordinator. Um, this is the database sizes, and then here's your top 10 tables. So here we can look and see, um, here's my top 10 tables uh, in our test environment, and it's broken down. Uh, yeah, this was because we didn't, uh, we were doing some testing. None of these have indexes on them per se. This one has a seven gig index, uh, but most of them don't have any indexing. Uh, clicking on this will give us the database explorer. But I want to scroll down just a little bit. Here's the output from PG Pool. So it goes and it pulls PG Pool, and it looks at okay. Well, here's all the data, all the nodes that are defined in my Postgres Excel environment, and it does a simple ping and port check, port check, and lets you know um, everything else that's on there, the node ID. Uh, if we scroll down, it also goes through there and it combines all the settings, all the system settings that are configured on each of the nodes. So uh, we could scroll down and it shows all of them that are out there. And it, so that way you can line them up and say, oh, well, I have one node that's configured for um, less connections. You may want to fix that. But so you can see here our data nodes actually have their connection, max connections set to two and our coordinators is set to 100. So it puts, it takes your entire environment and puts it all side by side. And then if you click on this Explore More, this will actually take you to the Database Explorer. And what that does is actually goes out using the coordinator that you selected and it will give you uh, this nifty little uh, tool allow you to go through and look at your databases, uh, their schemas. So here's one of them. Um, if you click on that, it will show you all your tables. Uh, and then you can click on, uh, like this is a, a schema. And then as you hover each O, it shows you the, the size. And then if you go, it goes all the way down to the data and um, the data and index level. So here's my data uh, size, it's 48.3 gig, and my uh, index size. Uh, one thing that we're adding, we're in the process of adding, is actually free space. So we'll be able to put a, a, a slice in here to show you total free space in your Postgres Excel environment. And that's going to be next. Um, and that's it, actually, for the, po the dashboard for now. And yeah, we talked about the sessions. And that's actually, a, you can see there, that's green. It means, hey, we're good to go. This is so far a healthy query. And there's the environment database explorer. So if you follow these, uh, just those simple guidelines, it's actually, once you deploy Postgres XL, and you go through and you change just a few minor things, you can actually have a really fast uh, data environment for both large data 
uh, as well as non-indexed querying. I mean, your environment is actually pretty stable. We use it in our production environment for all of our testing. And I'm sorry, not testing, but reporting for large tables. And uh, both the migrator and the dashboard are available. Javelin.mg slash PG Open 2015, as well as this deck. Uh, it's available now if you wanted to go pull up and pull it down, feel free. The uh, migrator and dashboard are actually on Git, so the, but there's links to those projects uh, here. And that's it. Do you have any questions? I got two questions. Yes. Well, we could, we didn't, to answer your question directly, we did not do a sizing per se, but the idea was if you have multiple databases running on one hard drive, then you're going to, at some point, you're going to hit I.O. contention. Um, yeah. So we had the hardware, it's kind of a commodity, the terabyte hard drives weren't exactly cheap, but the, uh, the idea is they're cheap enough that we could build out an entire environment. And so we, we did. Yeah, we did, this, we did a similar exercise and came up with a number of ratio about three to one. Oh, OK. Um, the other th the thing I was going to ask is it looks like you're not using PGXC, PGXL, um, PTL, the manager that's used for construction and destruction. You wrote your own. Did you run into some other issues that caused you to go down that path? So initially, I did it the hard way. And I was that guy that was banging my head against the keyboard. Um, I did not use PGXC. Uh, CTL, which for those you may not know, it's a, it's a tool to help automate the deployment, the restarting, uh, everything. It makes life easier. We didn't use it at first, and I, I eventually we, we do use it now pretty heavily. Can you use the, the yes, yes, yeah, yes. Sir. Um, it's yeah, well, a lot, right? Anytime a node, uh, but as soon as the node goes down, nothing works. Yeah, yeah, and then you bring that node back up. And generally, what we do is we bring the whole thing down and come and bring everything back up, and it comes. So, this is, so it doesn't support any sort of. You can. Yeah, all the data nodes, they're underneath the covers, it's just a Postgres database. Um, and so you can do the uh, failover on that end. You just have to repoint everything and refresh your pool. But we haven't set any of that up, really. Can you talk a little bit to the data, um, the data design that you're using it for? Is there a lot of unique shards? And what's unique about the data transfer? What's unique is that there's no standard, right? Uh, we get a little bit of everything. Uh, we, inside of our environment, you're asking the type of data. So we get sales data. Uh, we get, uh, being a marketing firm, we get a lot of uh, event data and uh, campaign data. So a client will blast out an email, let's say. And so we'll have the campaign metadata, which will then be, that's the replicated data uh, tables that we have. Uh, and that's all information about the campaign. And then we get the mail file, which says, all the emails and maybe some content and some other metrics about the email. And then uh, we get the responses. And those are, they'll be time stamped. When did they, when did the user or the client or customer open the email? What links did they click on? All that. And then we also get sales data. And then we kind of do some magic and we tie everything together and we see. Um, we do it lots of different ways, but um, you know, I'd have to. We can talk offline, and I'll bring in the rest of my team, and they can go into exhausting detail on how they do it. Yeah, yeah. We we have several methods that we we do use and employ fairly regularly. All right. Anything else? Well, thank you. This has been a pleasure. <laughs>